Hello everyone. Today we don't have a microphone, so I have to speak loud. Um, if you can't hear me at any time or you can't understand me, please raise your hand and like tell me that I can't hear you so that I could like, talk even louder if I can. Um, sorry if my voice breaks, I need to take some water, a sip of water sometime. But thank you for coming here. Thank you for being here. It's an amazing crowd that I, I, I see from here. It's, I have to congratulate you because just being here is an amazing feat by itself. Like you're out of your comfort zone. Most of you are out of your comfort zone and you're like, life starts after your comfort zone. Success starts, improvement starts out of your comfort zone. So I would really, it doesn't matter whether it's your first time or it's your like 10th time in Women Tech Makers Demand. It's just amazing that you're here. So please, I would like you to give yourself a round of applause before starting. Yay. All right, as Arman like, gave a little bit of introduction, today we're going to get into the mysterious and beautiful world of backend engineering. So let's rephrase, let's recap. Can anyone tell me what is the difference between a backend and a frontend? Please raise your, raise your hands and tell me. Please. Frontend is what you see, and backend is what happens behind the curtain. All right. Is, is there any, any other definition? Please. Frontend is client side and backend is server side. Okay, what is a client side? Is it like customers paying money? Uh, no, it's basically what Ashin said. But <laughs> <laughs> the user sees and server side is what's happening in the backend. Okay, where, 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 what is a server? Where is a server? Can anyone tell me what is a server? Please. Um, a server serves up information and data uh, as that has been requested by someone, such as a client. Okay, perfect. Where is that server? Is it on your computer? When you go on google.com, does your computer serve google.com? No, it doesn't. Um, google most likely has a lot of computers of their own, so True. that traffic goes to that computer and then serves up that information to your that's perfect thank you very much for all of the answers that's mostly true like that's 100 percent true like there are many computers like take the google case in uh, into account google has like thousands of powerful computers all around the world that whenever you type google.com on your browser there's some magic happening in, in in the background and you end up in one of the google servers that's very powerful like racks of rooms of servers there which doesn't have even a keyboard attached to them they don't have any screen attached to them they're just servers that literally serves you your website today we're going to take a step into that world where the the, the software runs in that server in the cloud or in somebody else's computer not on your computer but in the other, like on the server side of events. That's what we call a backend. All of the databases, all of the infrastructure, all of the other things that you don't see on your screen happens on the backend side of things. And the frontend side of things is, it starts whenever you launch your browser or you, when you launch your desktop application or when you launch your mobile application, when you launch any kind of application that you interact with. As a user, that is the front-end side, that is the client side, and all the rest, all of the things that serve you, that data, that information that needs to be displayed is on the back-end side of things. All right, um, today, that our, like, our main language, our, the, our focus is JavaScript, so we're going to focus on Node.js. Do you know what Node.js is? Please raise your hands and tell me what Node.js is. Great, uh, please. Okay, is is it is it a language? Is it a different language than JavaScript? Like Node.js is is like any other language. It's a library. It's a library. All right. Okay. Let me give you a brief definition. Node.js is an open source, um, cross-platform runtime environment that can run JavaScript. What does that mean? Open source means that it is written by us, it is available online. Every line of code is available online. It is developed by the community. Of course, there's a board that manages what to do next, but it's also, it's also an open society. So it's an open source. And the second thing is the cross-platform. What does cross-platform mean? It just means that it can run on multiple different architectures, which means it can run on Linux, it can run on Macintosh, it can run on Windows, and it can run many, on many other platforms as well. So it's a multi, it's a cross-platform environment. 
And what does a runtime environment mean? It's it's it just means that like it, there, there is a there is a software that is written by in this case C plus plus that just takes your input in this case JavaScript files and then understands them and translates them into what machines can understand. This it does it like during runtime, which means that it just happens dynamically. It just happens live. It just happens real time. It just um, it, it, do you know what a compiler is? Do you know what a compiled language is? Please raise your hands and tell me what a compiled language is. No? All right. Let me explain you. But I don't want to spend too much time in these details. There are, there are two kinds of languages. One of them is the compiled languages where you write the code and then there is a magic somehow in, the, in your computer that translates that code into machine code, where how machines can understand before you run it, actually. So it's just dot, dot .exe files on Windows. It's just it's a binary code that only machines can. If you open it with a notepad, you don't ever understand it. It's just gibberish. But with the runtime environment, you just give it a JavaScript file, and it just gets the text. It's written by human, it's just text, and then understands it, interprets it, and then turns it into the machine code in, in real time. So today, we're going to take a look at Node.js runtime environment. So does, any, does, does everyone have Node.js installed? It was, it was posted on the Slack. Um, if you don't, please go on to nodejs.org, and please download the current, the latest one, the latest and the greatest one here. Does anyone, um, don't, do, does anyone not have Node.js installed in their computers, on their computers? Please raise your hands. OK. And please follow these instructions. And if you, can, if you can install it, please ask for assistance. This is really, really crucial for today's uh, topic. No. OK, then let me continue. Um, as like last week's lecture, Armand used the Chrome browser to run his JavaScript code. So that is technically, as we as as we already mentioned, it's it's a client side, right? It's on the, it runs on the browser. It's Google Chrome is a client, and we ran JavaScript code on the browser side. Today we're going to switch to the backend side of things. So we can't use the browser to run our code, right? We will use the Node.js engine that we're going to install into our computers, and we just need an environment at, 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 at Scratchpad, just like a Scratchpad that Armand used last week, we need an environment to write our code in. As Armand already introduced, we are using, for this case, Visual Studio Code. It's an IDE. It's an integrated development environment. It is just a fancy uh, notepad. It's, 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 it has a lot of, lot of uh, important features for developers, built for developers, and I'm going, I'm going to show a few of them today, but in your, in your free time, please, please research, read about Visual Studio Code, its plugins, its capabilities. It will, it's, if you're going to be a JavaScript engineer, it's going to be your main tool of trade uh, during your career. So this is, this is, this is where we're going to run as, like, as the first application when, you're, when we open our computers, when, we, when, we, when, when our operating system launches. All right. For that we think we're going to install Visual Studio Code. I hope you already installed Visual Studio Code before, because this is also a crucial part of this uh, lecture. Please make sure that you have the latest version of Visual Studio Code. Is there anyone that doesn't have Visual Studio Code <coughs> installed? Please raise your hands. It should be fairly simple. It's a Mac or a Windows application. It's not like Node.js. It doesn't install a lot of things into the system. It should be a fairly, fairly simple process. So please, please install the application. And you're going to, I hope you're going to, whenever you launch the Visual Studio Code, you're going to see something like this. Maybe you're going to be welcome with a welcome screen, but it's going to be an empty uh, window without anything. So the first thing that we're going to do is just, we're going to create a new file. Now, before Node.js, this wasn't even imaginable. Like JavaScript, it was a language that was only front-end engineers used. And for, to do things on the backend, to do things on the server side, you had to learn a new language, like PHP, like ASP.NET, like C Sharp, like Ruby. You had to learn, you had to learn a new language to be able to develop on the backend side. This is a revolution for us. By just learning a single language, JavaScript language, you can now build applications both for the front-end and on the backend, and for the desktop, and for the mobile. It's, it, is, it, it is really everywhere, and you are at the perfect place now to be learning JavaScript right now. 
It is. It, it could be the best thing that you could do for your careers. Okay, it's 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 customary. Let's start with the console log. Hello world. If you remember, console log was a function that we use that we used to print things on the screen, right? And uh, as you can see, you can you don't see any um, highlighting, any coloring here because my uh, my IDE doesn't know that it's a JavaScript file. So when I save it. Uh, and give it name of an index.js, it will now understand that it's a JS file and it will just color it up beautifully. Okay, how do we run this? In the, in the Chrome browser, you would just click the play button or just command enter. Here, we need, we need something that we call a terminal. Here in the view, um, Oh, it's in, in the terminal. Okay, here in the terminal, you, you're going to see a new terminal button. Please click on it, and you're going to see a new window. Will a part window will appear in the in the lower hand of the screen. And please make sure, like, uh, please type um, uh, for the Windows uh, for the Mac users, please pwd. This means a print working directory. And for the Windows users, I guess it's just cd, cd enter, and make sure that the you are on a folder that you're going to work. That we're going to put today's code in. Like, we please have an empty folder, like name it week two or whatever you want. We're going to be working there. Make sure that your your terminal points to that uh, terminal uh, to that folder. If you if your terminal doesn't point to that folder, please ask for assistance. We're going to be using uh, that folder to make sure that you are in the correct folder. Please type node space index.js and press enter to see hello world display. Okay, let's remember last week's course. And if you haven't, if you weren't here last week, please watch the video. It's already posted on YouTube. Please watch it. I'm just to go, going to go over a few details that Arman uh, told you last week. If you remember, there was a function called add last week that take that, that took two arguments and then converted them into an actual addition. Right? How how did we write that? We wrote var add and Parentheses num1, num2, a fat arrow, and num1 plus num2. Here, as Arman already mentioned last week's lecture, he used the definition, uh, he used var to define variables, but he also mentioned that it was an old way of doing things. And he said that there is a new uh, const and let keywords introduced into the language. I'm not going to get into the details. We can talk after the class why it changed and how it is different. But from now on, from this lecture on, we're going to be using const and let to, de to define variables. There is a very simple difference between them. If you define a variable using a let keyword, it allows you to change that variable afterwards. So let me just show a really quick example. By the way, if you type node into your terminal and press enter, you're going to have an interactive environment just like Chrome browsers do, like 4 plus 3 equals 7. You can just see that. And here, you can just declare a variable with let a equals 1, right? And then you can change its value to 2. This is how let behaves. This is just like how var behaves. There's a small difference, but I can uh, tell you after the course. And the const, what const does is once you declare a const variable, you can't change its value. It will just throw an error at you. It just literally means that it's constant, that you can't change it. And from now on, by default, we'll be using constant. We will be using const declarations. And there will be some times that you would need to change the value of the variable. <laughs> then you would use a let. But by default, please always use const, just like we used var in the previous lecture. So this is an addition function, right? Its, it's name is add. It is a function that takes two arguments. One is number one, the second one is number two, and it just adds them together and then returns it to you. How do we test this? Console.log, right? Add, or just even better, like let's, let's use this. Addition result equals add four, seven, and then console.log addition result. Let's run this by typing node index.js. We can just run this. And we see the hello world as the first line. And we see the 11 on the second line. Can anyone, can everyone see the, the, the addition result on your screen? Please raise your hands if you see the addition result. 
Perfect. All right, let me continue. Let's, add, let's have a multiply function. Can anyone tell me what the multiply function, what should I type to have a multiply function? Please raise your hands and tell me. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Okay. Great. And let's see. Let's have another multiply result and it should be multiply like four times six and multiply result <coughs> why did it say none <laughs> correct like you're very very quick i didn't make i didn't make that mistake intentionally but you're really quick to catch it all right and can anyone see the result of uh, the, the multiplication as well. Now I'm going to teach you a really, really important skill. Really important skill. It's one of the essential skills of a good software engineer. And many, many developers don't know that. It's called debugging. Do you know what debugging is? Do you know where the name comes from? Please raise your hands and tell me. Please. Um, I don't remember her name, but I believe it was someone like way back in the day who used to Correct. Okay. That is amazing. That's that's very true. It was in the 1940s where Admiral Grace Hopper, a human engineer, a software engineer, one of the first software engineers, she realized that something was not working correctly. And then whenever she went into the huge mainframe computers, like room big computers, and she found a bug that created a short circuit somewhere that, that, that happened to affect the result of the machine. So he, she just put that bug out and then taped it on her um, notebook, like on her like notes. And you can see the pictures of it over the online. It's an amazing terminology. You are just debugging the software. And we still use that terminology nowadays. Anything that, that affects the, 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 the functionality of a program is a bug. And then what you do as software engineers to understand and fix it is called debugging. All right? I'm going to show you a really, really powerful future of Visual Studio Code. And it's, you can see that there's a debug menu up there. Let's click on start debugging. You're going to see that it will autom automatically open the de debug console here. If you can't see it, please click on the little bug. Okay. You can see that there's a little icon that, that says no to bugs. Please click on it and you're going to see the, the, the tab menu, the tab bar here and click on debug console. You're going to see, you, you should be seeing a hello world and the, the operations that you just did, just like your terminal. All right. But as you can see, just run the code, just like we just that we type node index and enter. What we want to do is try to understand what's happening in the code. So I'm just going to make a mistake in my code and then try to understand what is happening. So I'm just going to change this, uh, the, the multiply operation first parameter as the addition result so i'm going to first add two numbers together and then and then multiply them so technically we're going, i'm just going to add four and seven together and then multiply with six all right so if i just rerun it again i'm just going to see why is my computer slow i'm just going to see 66 which is actually the correct result but somehow while i'm developing this i made a mistake instead of the asterisk that 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 tells you that you multiply two numbers i just put a minus sign that means that you just subtract things and i just when i run my code i see the result incorrectly so i just see five. Oh my god there's something wrong with my application i should understand what is wrong in this in this case you can easily see what is wrong but in the huge in, in the huge projects where there are like 
thousands of files and thousands of lines of code, it's really, really hard to, to see what you, how you made that mistake. So we have a really powerful feature that's built into our, uh, in, into our IDEs that's called breakpoints. If you hover your mouse over the, the left-hand side of the numbers and the line numbers, you can see that there's a dim little red circle. And wherever you put that circle, and whenever you run the debugging mode, which I'm going to do in a, in a second, you, your code will just stop there, uh, stop executing. Let me do that. Start debugging. You can see the yellow uh, arrow there. That, that denotes that you're in the first line of the code. And that means that you can just uh, inspect whatever is happening at that moment in time. And then we can move forward in time one by one, step by step, to understand what is happening one by one. Because normally you just see the output of your program, right? Here we want to see every step, everything that the computer does to, to, to make you see that result. We're going to see that. So there is a, there is a button in, uh, here. It's the step over. It's the F8 uh, in, in my computer. Uh, when you click on it, you're just going to see that you'll go on to the next line. And on the left-hand side, you're going to see a, a, a small window that says variables, that lists all of the variables that are defined at that moment in time. We're going to get that uh, afterwards, get there afterwards. But it's just really, really useful to see what's going on there. And here on the, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the below panel, there's a watch. Watch means that you just can type any expression there that can be num1 plus num2, let's say. And it, it will always display the, the, the result of that uh, number at all times. Currently, they are not defined. And I'm just going to step over. It says that now, now we have an add function here. And then whenever I step on it, uh, step over it, we can, we, I can see that there is an addition result. When I hover on the addition result, I can see that there is uh, it's this, its value is displayed as 11. Oh, that's correct. At 4 plus 7 is, is, is 11. So the mistake is not here. I'm just going to continue. I define the multiply function. I logged the addition result, which is correct. And then multiply result, whenever I hover on it, it says 5. Oh, the, then now I realize that the, my mistake is on the multiply function, not the addition function. I stepped over each line, each line, each line. I understood that my mistake is on the multiply result. This is a very, very simplified version of debugging, but you can imagine in real life scenarios where all functions, this add function could be like thousand line wrong. I hope it's not, please no, don't make your functions thousand line wrong. But imagine in the big, big projects where really complicated business logic is going on, you sometimes don't see what, what's happening like at that exact glance. You have to debug it. And here it allowed me to debug my code and understood the mistake. Okay, it should be in the multiply function. I see the uh, uh, mistake and I corrected it. And now I want to run it once more. Here I stop in the first line again. Next line, next line, next line, next line. Now I hover on it, multiply result is 66. That's the correct number. So I fixed the bug in my code. I debugged my code by using Visual Studio's uh, native debugging functionality. Did everyone follow me upon here? Do you have any questions so far? Does everyone, could everyone uh, manage to debug their code line by line? All right, let's get back to the lecture. As I, as I mentioned, as I told you before, debugging is one of the essential skills that, that, that a software developer need to have. And it will, it will, just, it will just put you one step uh, like ahead of the other developers if you, have, if you perfect your de debugging skills. You will be the one to go to when there is a problem. And you will get the respect of your fellow engineers, fellow developers. It's an amazing feature that to debug something, to fix the problem. Because like most of our time is spent on debugging, let, let me be honest. Like we, we just write two hours of code per day, maybe, and then the, spend the rest four hours to find a, a bug that a typo somewhere in our code, trying to understand what happened, trying to fix things. And if you, if you perfect your debugging, you would be much more faster, you would be more efficient, you would help the others, and you'll get the respect of others. So please, Please improve your debugging skills. This is the first step into debugging. I just showed you a little 
tip of the iceberg and debugging goes very way down there are many many other features of debuggers uh, I, I i would love to talk to you about that after the the lecture but for now please make sure that you understand the reasoning behind it not not just to see the output of the code but just to see what is happening while you run the code like line by line what's happening actually what runs after the other what runs after the other what is the result that is passed to the next function it's an amazing feature because a lot of developers just write console.log everywhere in their code just to print everything dump everything on the screen and it's just without context it just doesn't mean anything it's a log but who printed this log you have to type like hello a b c d and try to to, to keep that in mind okay a was here b was there this log this this is really really bad practice please please try to use this breakpoints debugging features this watch features and variables uh, like it, it, like uh, that is embedded. That's natively embedded into your IDE. That that would be an amazing skill to improve on. So let me just continue uh, with this. I'm not just I'm not going to talk more about debugging, but I'm just going to uh, get started on building your first backend, a real backend project. I'll start by recapping last lectures uh, topics. If you remember, we uh, we created two classes. Uh, one of them was the person class, and the other one was the meetup class. Right. And there was an interaction between them. The persons could attend the meetups, right? That we created the person. I'm just going to type it in a moment. Uh, I just don't want you to, to look at the screen all the time. And we just created a few persons with their names. They had their names and their ages, right? And then we had meetups that had, uh, again, names, locations. And it had attendees. So whenever a person needed to attend a meeting, we would just call a method on the person, right? Arman.attend. And we just gave the meetup's name so that in, in, in the end, the, the person had the meetup uh, saved in their meetups array. And the, the meetup would uh, have the attendees, the, the persons that attended the meetup saved. All right. Um, I, I just don't, for the newcomers, I just don't want you to type everything. That's why we prepared um, a, a summary um, of our classes. It's, you can see on github.com slash WTM Berlin. There you would see the repository called JSCC 2018. There you see two folders. One of them is the first week's end results. And I would like you to go on to the week two uh, folder and there's a single file index yes, you could just directly copy the contents of it or if you are if you if you like you can just clone the repository but I would just like you to copy the contents of it into your own IDE you can see I'm just going to recap like real quickly there's a special keyword in JavaScript called class we just create classes just objects that represent real life uh, that has uh, and that has names. Here in this case, we are looking at a meetup class. It is a, it's an encapsulated, uh, it is, it's an entity that, that represents a, a real life object in our life. So a meetup can have a name and a location. This is what we designed last week. We can always add more on top of it, but I'm just going to recap what we had. It had a name, it had a location, it had an attendees array. All right, let me continue. There's the meetup class has a name, a location, and attendees, and it, it, it has a special function uh, called constructor that, that we pass the initial arguments while we're creating that meetup. And this, in this case, it takes a name and a location, and it just saves it as its own. Like this is a keyword that, that it, it then uh, annotates that, that uh, whatever you put into this will be that person's own. So whenever you need it, you can access it, all right? And, um, there is the person class that takes a name and an age, like that the, the first parameter is name and the other ones. It also saves it on, on its own and it has an attend uh, method, a special function that is on that object and that class. And it just takes a meetup argument. And whenever you want to attend the meetup, you just pass it and it just adds it to the meetups attendees list. So let's, let's quickly try something. Let's say like, let's create a person first. I'm going to create another person. So how smart equals new person in parentheses in code smart, um, comma, and 33 is the number, it's the age. Um, and then you close parentheses, which should already be there for you. The second line, the second person is const arman um, equals new person. And you again pass in the name and an age, and then you basically log that. Um, if you already installed 
Node.js, and if you can run it in the terminal, that's fine. You can type node in Next.js and see the output. If you don't, you can run the debugger and see uh, the output again. So, okay. So node that index .js would run uh, it again. I I I commented like it's, I deleted the these console logs of edition results so that I don't want to that to interview with my results. I just added a single console log at the end that prints Mert and Armand. And as you can see, you can uh, see there's um, there are two persons that are logged onto my console. The first one is a person object with a name Mert and age 33. And the second one is the another person object that has the name Armand and age 34. Now I guess we need a meetup. I'm, I'm going to do the same thing, for this time for the meetup class. I instantiated using the new keyword a person, two persons actually, and now I'm going to continue with instantiating a meetup. Let's say WTM Berlin equals new, this time meetup. If you remember meetup, again took two arguments. The first one was its name, right? Um, women tech makers. Berlin, and the second one was location, Eurostat. So let me just log that meetup as well. As you can see on the terminal, persons are logged again because I didn't remove the console log there. But we can see a new object that is represented here in the terminal. It's it's a meetup object. It has a name, Human Tech Makers Berlin. It has a location, Eurostaff. It also has another property that's called attendees. We didn't give, we didn't pass it in because it's already by default there. If you take a look at its uh, definition, the class definition, it is already instantiated as an empty array. We don't have to give anything. We don't have to pass anything. It's already there. It is instantiated for us. But for the other two properties, the name and location, we have to, we need to pass them in. That's just what I did here while creating the meetup. Human Tech Makers Berlin and Eurostaff. All right, let me continue. Like you can imagine, like in a real, real application, you would have hundreds, tens, dozens, or hundreds of classes, hundreds of th thousands of lines of code. And if you just add them, continue adding them into a single file, like index.js, it would be completely unmaintainable. Not that the computer cares, it just doesn't care. It can run anything that you do, you can run a single file. But this is for us, this is for developers to read. That, 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 that will be another developer that will read your code. The machine will just run it, even, th even though it's a single file, it will just run it. But for us, for us developers to understand what's going on, to have, to, to, to manage the complexity of our, of, our, uh, of our software, we need to separate things, we need to modularize things, we need to, we need to think, we need to take things that are related to each other and put them into different files. Does it make sense? Right? Yeah, and we go, we're just going to do do that in Node.js. There's a there's a there's there's a notation of modules. Everything, every file could be a module that could be required by other files. So that's like a plug and play. I just need this one. I need this one. I need this one. I'll, I'll just collect them together and then run the code. I don't have to put everything into a single file. I can put things in different files and then use them together to to achieve something. So here we're going to do. Just that. First of all, we need a new file. Let's start with the person class, all right? Like we need the person as an entity. The person class should not be in our index.js. Index.js should be the one that instantiates, that, that creates a person, but it doesn't have to know how to create. Like what are the contents of that class definition? It just needs to know how to create. It just needs to know the name. It just needs to know the person and it will just give the parameters and it will just create it. So here I'm just going to move the person class definition into another file. All right. Here you can just click on a new file and then type person.js. It's going to be obviously another JS file. All right. And then I'm just, I'm going to copy the person class 
you can see that the, the curly bracket starts here and ends here. I'm just going to copy the whole class definition and then paste it into another file that's called the person.js. And I save the file. OK. I will remove the other one. By the way, I copied and pasted it. You should just cut it and paste it. I, want, I just want the person definition to be gone from the index.js. Now, when I run my code, what will happen? An error. An error. Why do you think so? We don't have a connection between them. OK, we created a new file. We know that it exists, but our index doesn't know it exists. So we need our index.js to have some form of connection to that other file, all right? For that, we need, we have a terminology that's requirement, that we require that file to run, all right? We will require the person.js in the index.js to be able to run our application. So it's, it's literally a requirement. And we generally write the requirements at the top of the file. You don't have to. You can write it in the middle and then use it. But generally, it's better to have all the requirements of that file at the top of the file. So I'm just going to, I just scrolled at the, to the first line, and I'm just going to require a file. So I will continue where I left off. I was just talking about two different files, two different modules, depending on each other. Like our index.js should depend on the person, right? And right before we went into the break, I asked the question, what will happen if I just run the index.js as it is? Uh, if you remember, I just removed the person class definition. I put it into the second file, and I did nothing else. That file is there, we know it, but our index doesn't know it. And someone said that there's going to be an error, all right? Let's see what the er error is. I just ran the code. I'm sorry, my screen like only fits that amount of text, so I'm just going to do this. And there is going to be a very explicit error. What does it say? It says person is not defined. That makes sense, right? Because we, we didn't define the person yet. It is there in another file. So let's let's make index.js know about that person. We were talking about require keyword. Like it's what we use in Node.js to denote that a file, a, a, a module, in this case index is also a module, that requires another file. So, and I was just typing this, so I'll just continue. Constant person. I'll just define the person. This is our variable declaration, right? We just defined previously the cl person class as this, like this. So the person equals, this time instead of writing class and person and whatever, it's already there. I just need to reach it. It's the name, like literally is require something. And to require... Yes. Matt, are you are you right now in index or are you are in? I'm in index right now because person is there. I need index to know about person. I don't want person to know about index, not the other way around. I want index to know what the person is. So I'm I'm requiring the person module in index. So there is like um, for to to be able to do that, I would just like to write person here. But this person is like a vague term. I need to point to that exact file where the person is. So in, in all operating systems, you, the, the dot, the, the, anything that starts with the dot in, 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 in case of a path, that means that you're in the current directory. Our person is on the current directory. And it's followed by a slash, means that it is a file inside this current directory. Because dot is only the directory. Slash is just like a URL in the browsers, like slash, Facebook slash likes or something. Here, dot slash person or person.js, it just automatically adds JS at the, end, at, at the end of the file. That means that let's take that person file and load it into our memory in, in index.js. I saved the file. Now that we define the person, what do you think will happen? Will everything run all right? No. no. Raise your hands and tell me why not. Export. All right. What does export mean? Raise your hands and tell me. 
No, okay. Please. Oh, okay. That's that's a really really nice explanation. Okay, we have a person module here. It just exists on its own, but from the outside, it doesn't it doesn't export and it doesn't tell what it is. Because sometimes you want some things to be hidden away from the user, and you just want them to use whatever you export them, like. Like you will define some methods for the outside world to use and you will keep some methods and properties to yourself. In this case, we need to export something. By default, all of the modules in, in, in Node.js just export an, an empty object. It just doesn't export anything. Here we need to export the person class actually for us to be able to use it in the uh, outside world. To be able to do that, we have a keyword module dot exports. Can you see it? Yes. I just module that exports is a special object that is defined in every every Node.js module, and we are just assigning a value to module that exports now, so that whenever we want to use the person that we will we will just be pointed directly here. This is what I export. The file says. So I saved the file. Do you think it will run now? Yes? yes? yes. Raise your hands if you think it will run. Raise your hands if you don't think it would run. It will provide an error. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just run it. Oh, sorry. Woo! It ran. <laughs> Amazing. Now. Let's 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 rephrase. Let, let's check. We don't have any person class definition inside index.js file. We only required it from another file. It could be anything, and we used it as if we had the definition inside index.js. So we now required the thing. Yeah. Can you please go back to person and to see so I can of course to to when you write exactly to the Okay, it just starts with module.export. There are other ways to export it, but this is the default way. It's like backward compatible with all versions of Node.js. And it just means that you're exporting that class to the outside world. And there are sometimes cases that you need to export multiple things, not only this definition, but there could be helper uh, things like that's that sidekick of this class, or there could be multiple classes, multiple functions that could help you, then we would we would use a different method then. Here, you're just only only exporting a single thing, and it's just the way to go. Module.export equals that thing that you're going to export. So I'm just going to do the same thing for the meetup, right? That just makes sense. When the person is another file, why not the meetup is in another file? It just will like it will just help us in, in, in de decreasing the complexity of our application. So what I'm going to do is do the same thing. I'm just going to create a new file in the same directory with the index.js and the person.js, just like we did before. And now I'm just going to name it meetup.js. I'm just going to copy this class definition. I'm just going to cut this time and then put it into meetup.js. I just pasted it. I saved it. What shall I do next? Can anyone raise their hands and tell me? What shall I do next? Please. Module export. Module export? That's amazing. Where should I put the module that exports? In meetup.js. In meetup.js. Which line? First line. First line. So like this, module.exports. And what else? Equal. Equals. So I'm assigning the value of that class definition into module that exports, which means that I'm exporting to the outside world so that other modules, it doesn't have to be indexed, <laughs> any other module can use that file. OK, so now that I have exported the meetup class, what shall I do next? Please raise your hands and tell me. Please. Uh, go to index okay. and, um and Const, um, here at the end, the last line? Uh, at the first. As the first line. Yeah. 
Okay, here. Just change the const. Const meetup. Uh -huh. Equals require. All right, that's so good. Now we have a person required and a meetup required, and our code uses the person and the meetup. Do you think it will work? Shall I run? Yes. yes, let's try. Okay, then I need to scroll. I just typed node.index and I can see the first hello world that was on the top of my program. And I see that the other logs that I logged with, like Mert and Arman, we logged it here. And here at the end, we have a WTM. Uh, I logged the WTM, which is the meetup object, the meetup class that's instantiated. And we see that it has a name a location and zero attendees. A meetup is very boring without attendees. What should I do to make someone attend that meetup? Please raise your hands and tell me, what should I type to make someone, let's say Arman, attend the WTM meetup? Let me show you the meetup, uh, per, sorry, person definition here. What do we have here? Please raise your hand, please. Uh, Armand.attend Armand .attend. Okay, let's try that um, Armand.attend, right? And WTM, B, like this? All right, so By the way, I sneaked in a method here called report It just prints out a really nice sentence It's just a console log it says this name meetup is held at this location and number of attendees are this attendees dot length. That length is new for you, but let's let's go over it. Like as you know, attendees were an array. Arrays were collection of events, collection of things, like Arman and Manth in the last lecture was the instructors, and you could just or attendees, you could have multiple persons inside the attendees. So it has a, it's a single a variable that holds multiple things in it, all right? So it's just natural that that thing can have a length. It will just give me the count of the attendees, the number of total items in that array. If you want to learn more about this, please take a look at the You Don't Know JS and Modern JS Chichi. It's explained very beautifully there. It would be really, really nice if you read that. And here, I'm just going to, instead of typing like console log WTM, I just would like WTM to report itself. What should I do to tell WTMB, the meetup uh, object, to report itself? I'll just go back to meetup. Please raise your hands and tell me. Yes, please. Um, Parentheses. Okay. He said WTMB. Let me type. Here, WTMB dot report with parentheses. Why do we need the parentheses? Please raise your hands and tell me. Yes, please. To evaluate the function. All right, that's that's really good. Normally, we would just Arman dot name. We, we can reach the property of a of a of a class here. In this case, if you if you type uh, WTMB dot name, you would get the name. But report is a special thing. It's not a single value that holds, but it's, it's a method. It's a special function that is inside the class. So it's, we need to run it. We need to execute it. And parentheses tell us to, for the, the interpreter, the Node.js engine, to run it. We could give arguments to it. If you remember, while creating this new person, it just inside the parentheses, we would just give arguments. Or in the add function if you remember while running the add while executing the add function we would just give parameters but if we don't need parameters in this case in this report we don't need parameters we just leave it empty it's just an open uh, parentheses and close parentheses and it's just will run it will just execute so let me just save the file and run the file uh, the script again what do i see it says women take makers berlin this is dynamic i i just instantiated the wtmb with this name, so it prints that name. If you remember here in the meetup uh, class definition, in the report method, you see that 
it console log starts with this dot name. It means that whatever that object is, whatever I am in the in the eyes of that object, I will print my name first. It won't print this name. It will print whatever that name is, how we instantiated it, and then it prints a static text. Meetup is held at, and then again dynamic. This dot location, and then number of attendees, whatever. So here in the reported section, we see that the location is correct. Number of attendees are one. We would like to increase attendance. So I also would like to attend that event. What should I do? I should nerd dot attend again the same event WTMB and I just save it and then I will just run the same file and now I see that the attendees are two. Okay. Please raise your hands and tell me how do I get the list of the attendees from the WTMB object. Please raise your hands and tell me, please. Um, WTMB.attendees. WTMB Let's try that. Console.log WTMB.attendees. That was indeed correct. I now see that it's an array. You can understand that it's an array, that it starts with a square bracket. It just denotes that it's a list of things to come. We started with an empty, if you remember, in the this attendees, it started as an empty, and then we start, started adding things on top of it, added, adding persons. So in this case, we have two items in the array that, that both are person objects, and one of them is Arman, the other one is me. So did everybody get the, the, the modules and person and meetup and instantiate them and put them in index.js and run? This works in everybody, right? This is, this is going to be your next homework. Maybe it's a good time to talk about that. Um, last week, you wrote stuff on an index.js or in, in Chrome browser. This week, the homework is break up your classes into these separate files like person.js or meetup.js, whatever your classes are, break them up into those classes and require them in an index.js file and work with that. And again, we're going to ask you to submit this to GitHub, basically. Of course, there's going to be more. And let us, let us move forward. We're now entering a dangerous territory again. I'm not sure if this is going to work um, for everybody. I'm going to type npm in it. Please follow. In that folder, npm stands for node package manager. So you saw these modules over here, person.js and meetup.js. They are modules, right? And in fact, they're also called packages. Now, this is everything we do is open source, and we rely on other people. We basically rise on the shoulders of giants, other people who voluntarily share their code. And we build on top of that. So everything that we're going to do, all the libraries that we're going to use, like database libraries, web server libraries, everything is open source, and they are shipped as packages. So we need to pretty much um, manage a huge web of packages. Currently, our package index.js depends on the meetup package, sort of, and the person package, right? These are two dependencies. These are not called packages, these are called modules because they are local to me, that I created them. But again, I'm gonna depend on other people's work. And I'm gonna require them the same way, and they are gonna be external packages for this. So um, this is why the people who developed Node came up with the idea of NPM, Node Package Manager. Usually, each project will have around you know, 1,000 dependencies, 1,000 packages that they depend on. Anything that you do will depend on at least 1,000 other packages. So you know, you're just using free labor to streamline your work. Other people wrote the code for you, and you're just going to take it and use it. These packages are available online. Um, again, 99.9% .9 of them are open source. and um, now we're going to create our project as a package itself. 
And maybe if you want to open source it, you can also ship it as, as, a, as a package and other people can use it. Um, so in Node.js, every project is, in fact, a package. And it starts with the definition of a package. Um, this is why we typed npm init. npm init actually initializes a new package. So when you're inside a folder, when you type npm init, um, it's asking you several questions. You can read the, the, uh, the text there. Uh, but it says, give us a package name. It automatically takes the name of the folder that you're in. And um, you can pretty much press enter until it stops bugging you. Um, in the end, it will ask, is this OK? Just uh, tap enter again. And you're going to see a new file is already uh, popping up. It's package.json. Package.json is a file, um, a JSON file, and we're going to talk about that in a second. It's, it's a JSON file that defines your package. All right. If you see, it's like a, an object that we worked before, that we created before. It has a name, it has a version, it has a description, a main file, um, where the actual source code of that package is. And um, it has some scripts. It has an author and license details. Licensing is really important in open source. You cannot use other people's code if they don't let you. Even if you find the, the source code online, you cannot use it unless they give you an explicit permission for it. And we do this by defining the license of our packages. Here, it's ISC, which is a very uh, permissive license. There are all types of licenses, and you can um, find them online, uh, more definitions about them. We generally use MIT. Um, the, the, the school, MIT, the university came up with their own version of a license, which is, again, really uh, permissive. And you can type the author details if you want, uh, your name, and usually followed by your uh, email address in, in less than and greater than science. Um, but by creating this package JSON, we defined our own package. Okay? And the next thing that we're going to do is, therefore, we're going to be able to install other packages as dependencies. Because again, every, um, every project will depend on many, many other libraries. And what we're going to do is, for example, starting from next week and onwards, we're going to make use of, make heavy use of other people's codes, other people's libraries, and therefore we need a mechanism to define these dependencies and save them and their um, version. And yeah, just just as Arman mentioned, we need to stand on others' shoulders. Open source is powerful in that way. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we build something. We hope that if it's a meaningful thing, someone else probably built it, maybe even better than us. It's open source is amazing in terms of it is open source. Everyone can comment on it. Everyone can improve on it. Everyone can, if they don't like it, they can just fork it, copy it, and then build something on their own. If they uh, get into a discussion with the owner of the library and say that, that the owner doesn't like that other person's comment, he can just copy the code and then start on their own. There are many, many libraries that forked from very popular libraries and then th they become more, even more popular than the original ones, all right? So in this case, I'm going to use, I just, I just going to give you a use case. I just, if you remember my report, report method would just print a text on the command line, all right? But I would like it to be more colorful. I just want it to be, I don't know, Meetup's name to be bold or something. I, I don't know how to do that because it's not a browser. And the browser would just type B, bold, or something, or strong, some. It would just be bold or just type color red. It would just be red. But I don't know how to do it on my terminal. I already see that terminal supports colors, but I don't know how to do it. So either I research, probably there's some way that I need to put before my console log that makes them red or something. There are some special characters. But I would guess somebody's built it for me. Like, not for me, obviously, but somebody built it for themselves and were kind enough to make it open source, put it online so that I could download it, use it, depend on it. Let's see. In, in the Node.js world, we have a Node package manager, NPM. Every node installation hopefully comes with an npm already installed. Arman just type an npm in it. That is a part of that command. It just tells that node package manager to initialize a new package, a new, a new project. 
and you can after that step push it online it's the first step of creating the project so when you need another library you just again go to npm npm has a really really nice website npmjs.com there there's an there's a search bar that you can type anything it just indexes every available open source node.js library and there are just many keywords as you uh, arman uh, Armand created the package JSON. You could see that there are, oh, okay, he didn't type anything, so it's not there. There's a special thing he called keyword. You could add keywords there so that your library is, is easier to find by the others, all right? So here, in this case, I would like my console log to be colorful, right? I just type two keywords, color, it's, it makes sense, and console. It's just the first thing that comes to my mind. I just press enter, <clears throat> sorry. And I already see 572 packages that has color and console somehow indexed as keywords or as part of their code. It's amazing. 572 packages just for this. Maybe there are others that didn't do the SEO very well and we cannot find them, right? So and at the right hand side, you see a three meters popularity, quality, and maintenance, maintainability, or whatever. The, the topmost one, of course, it optimizes the search results for us. Chalk looks like an amazing library. It's very popular. Its code quality is very high, and it's been maintained very well. So I just want to use this chalk, but let's see if it does what I, what I want. It says that terminal styling done right. I just clicked on the package, and I'm, I'm just browsing. What's happening? Oh, it was downloaded 16 million times this week. Okay, then this thing is, I'm not weird, like, okay, the terminal coloring is a thing. So that's, that's amazing. It's already on the second point four version. And let's see what it does. Oh, okay, it does what I exactly want. It does the bold, italic, underline, red, green, even the backgrounds. Okay, I guess I can use this, right? But how do I use this? I just scroll a little bit down. It says, npm install chalk. Wow, such a simple comment. I just copy it without the dollar sign. And then go back to my IDE in the terminal section. And I just paste npm install chalk. And I press enter. Depending on the speed of our internet, it should be quite fast. Mine is done already. And it says edit seven packages from three contributors in four seconds. Oh, okay. So the chalk library is not a library by itself, but it also depends on other libraries. So this is again the power of open source. It says seven packages were added. I only wanted one, but obviously it, it, it required other packages as well. It just took them, required them, and put something on top of it so that we currently have seven packages. And when we take a look at our package.json that, that was created by the npm init command, you could see that in the dependent, there's a new object here that appeared. It says dependencies, and it just lists the chalk as a dependency. It has the latest version. So what, does, what that means is that your project from now on, if, even if you publish it open source, if you just give it someone else, whenever that project is installed with npm install, it would just install this dependency together with it. So this project now depends on chalk so that we could use the chalk. Where, that, where did the chalk go? You see that there's a new folder appear here at the top site called node underscore modules remember we use the keyword modules we created our own modules we put them in the same folder we could have put them anywhere we want just the only thing would that would make a difference does that will, will be this would be this path we said dot slash person if we put it in another folder let's say modules we'll just say modules slash person we can put anything we want into our project but the modules that we install from npm are always kept in the special folder called node modules. It literally says that these are node modules. Whatever you have in your package.json, whatever you install with npm install, it just adds it to the package.json and also it downloads the code that has already been put 
to open source community to npm and it just puts it into these node modules folder as you can see here i only installed chalk all right but i can see it. there are other libraries it says i installed seven libraries all right i don't have them the other ones as my dependencies but Obviously, Chalk has them. If you click on Chalk, you can see that it also has a package JSON. Everything in the Node.js community, in every library in Node.js, every project, everything has a package.json. It's just like a cover page. It just tells you what that project is, the name, the author, the license, the dependencies, whatever there is that you need to know about that project will be inside the package.json. So here, in this case, we see that there is an, a packet JSON inside the chalk, and if you if you check it, it has a lot of things that we didn't write in our in our in our uh, add our in our packet JSON. It requires that here you can see that in the dependencies section, it has three more dependencies. So it also depends on supports color library, and if you check the supports color library, probably it depends on the other libraries. It's just the power of open source. Everything builds on top of each other. Just like academia, you, you, you'd get something and then you build something on top of it so that we could improve as a society. And today, I'm not going to research the terminal color special characters. I'm just going to use the chalk library. And how do I do that? If you remember, <clears throat> we required, required our own modules, right? The, the modules that we wrote, the person class, the meetup class, we required them here. So the same keyword applies. We will require the chalk library. It's just as, it, as easy as it sounds. How do I write const chalk equals require? This time, there's a, there's a difference. We started our uh, requirement previously with dot slash because we wanted to point to a single file, right? This is a path, just like a URL. Dot was the current directory. Slash means that it's inside that directory and the file name would follow. But here in this case, as these are mod node modules that we installed from npm.js, you don't have to prefix them with anything. You would just type chalk without the dot slash. If, if I wrote dot slash, it would try to find a file in the current folder named chalk.js, which I don't have. But if I type it without the dot slash, it would just directly go look into the node modules folder, which in this case, it would find that thing. All right? Okay, now we required it, but how do we use it? How do we make something red? I don't know. I have no idea, actually. I could either go into the code of chalk itself, because it's open source, right? You could just go and check the code and try to understand what it does. Or you could just hope that the developer of that library, those quality bar doesn't fill itself. That quality means that that developer has presented nice documentation for its library. And it's, it's in the same place in the npm.js uh, website. You could see after the install, there's a huge section called usage. That's what we want, right? What it does is, it requires the chalk just like we did, right? We just did the same thing. And what does it do? It just console log. Instead of directly typing a hello world, it does, it calls another function. It calls chalk.blue. It appear, apparently turns that text into blue. Let's try that, all right? So I'll just take any console log. Let's say, um, arman.name if I run this code I would just see arman without any decoration any text decoration what do I need to do to turn to transform this text arman's name into blue can anyone raise their hands and tell me what shall I type to make it blue now that we know how to use chalk yes please chalk. Uh -huh. here chalk yeah chalk. dot no. Blue. Um, oh, yeah. Open the parentheses. Yeah. Is that enough? And you need to close it. I need to close the parentheses. So like this. Yeah. Okay. Let me run it. Just didn't work. 
It's capital when you require it. Great. I just wanted to keep the same um, syntax as we did. We require the, whatever we required. I made it as a, 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 a started with a capital letter because it denotes a class. And in 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 our like this is all a choice. Like you can use lowercase, uppercase. You can do whatever you want. It's just be consistent with whatever you do. Here in this case, I wanted to be consistent with the chalk, so I'm just going to continue doing that. So whenever I required it with this, uh, the capital C, I'll just, I need to use it as a capital C. It just doesn't, it's, it's case sensitive, not insensitive. So let's try. Ooh, Armand is blue now. Yeah. I hate that color, by the way. Oh, okay. Armand likes green. I, I know that he likes green. So I would just assume that it has a green function. Probably does, right? Yes, Arman is green now. <laughs> Amazing. So let's make use of I, As you've seen, we required it in the index.js file. I would like to use it in the reporting functionality of the meetup, right? Here, that was a really, really nice text that printed stuff. Can I just use chalk here? Like yes. chalk.bold, this name, let's say. Would it work? No. No? Why? We haven't required. Chalk. Okay. Great. So I, I mentioned this before. Every module can depend other modules, but we have to explicitly state that. There is no global requiring of something. There are some globals that like console.log. It's a global thing, but it's native to JavaScript. It's available everywhere. All right, but in the other modules, if you need to require another module, you have to explicitly state that. If if you need something in every file, you need to require it in every file because there are different separate entities in in the eyes of the engine, in, in the eyes of the Node.js engine. So here, in this case, what should I do to use chalk? Please raise your hands and tell me. Not you. Anyone else? How do I require chalk here in this file? Yes, please. Well, the same. Uh, same as an index chess. Yes, yes. so All right. He said it's just like the index chess. At the top of the file, I could just type const chalk and require. Chalk. You can see the advantage of using node modules here. You don't have to type the path because your files could be anywhere inside your directory structure. But to require a, a node module, you could just type the name of the, the library. You don't have to find where it is. You don't have to just dot slash whatever, whatever. You just type the name of the library and it's there already. So here, I want the meetup's name to be bold. I want the location to be, I don't know, blue, you get the idea. When I run it, okay, node index won't work. I need to report it. And I, I disabled the line. So I'm just calling WTM report, which in turn will call the WTM's own report function, which we just modified. And we hope that it would use the chalk library to color the output. Uh, yes, please. What if I want to? Like background color blue when sure. writing yellow. Okay, you could just again take a look at the the documentation. For the background, you could just use BG yellow, yeah. I guess. And oh, it's it's an amazing library. It just allows you to chain things. So you can just chalk dot blue dot BG red dot bold. That's cool. Let's use this. Okay, let's change the. Attend, oh, this is short, so let's change this meetup's name into a blue with a red background and bold. The things that we put, like after the dot, we, we put the name of the function that we want to call, and then another dot, another one. This is, this is called chaining things. We are chaining, we are putting things after one another. We just attach chains to them. So here, in this case, it would probably Okay, it's a red background, blue color, bold meetup name. It's amazing, right? 
if we wanted to do this on our own, probably it would take a lot of time. We would have to read a lot of documentation after it. It's possible, it's feasible, definitely. it's not secret. It's open source anyway. You could just go into the library and understand what's going on. Most of the time we do that. There are, there are libraries that we use and actually appreciate and on the, that we just want to learn how they made it possible. I just go into the code of an open source library and just by reading other people's code, you would improve yourself immensely because your world is limited to your knowledge. You should expand it. Other people may write better code than you, may not, but they may write better code than you. You should always, always keep an eye open for other people's code. I'm just going to show something. You don't have to do this. I'm just going to show you. All right. If you remember, when we npm when we installed the chalk library the node modules appeared on its own with a lot of libraries in it but obviously i'm i'm telling you this because i don't want you to submit your homeworks with node module folders involved because it is open source anyway we know what to install as long as we know what to install we can install that that is how the process works so please don't commit node modules folders for the next homeworks, for the following homeworks. I'm just going to demonstrate something. I'm just going to delete node modules folder. I just delete it. I don't care. If I run my code, it won't work because it's not there. But there is a special command that we use to install chalk. But if we don't provide the name of the library, if we just provide npm install, it would just take a look at the package JSON and see, oh, okay, there's a dependency here, so that I need to install that. I just press enter, and node modules appeared, reappeared back, and here, yeah, I, I still see the libraries, and I just run the code, oh, not npm install, it doesn't matter, you can run as many times as you want, and when you run your code, you can see that your library still works, and we lost connection. <laughs> it's just enough to put the dependencies in the package JSON when submitting your code. What as reviewers or any other person who requires your code or wants to run your code, all that they need to do is just type npm install. And they will have exactly the same files that were intended because we, we put the version number, specifically this version, we want that dependency. So you could make sure that the person who's installing that dependencies will see the same thing that you're going to see. So please don't submit node modules with your project submissions. It just doesn't need, we just don't need that. Here it's just seven folders. It just seems small, but imagine a big project, like an enterprise project would have 200 dependencies. Like it's just, it's just unnecessarily, both in terms of space, file size, and time that needs to download that thing. It, you just don't need it. All right? One more. Okay. If everyone followed me so far, I would like to congratulate you. This is an amazing achievement. We just, what we did, just remember, we tried, we, we started with Chrome last week's lecture. We had a few classes there. We just had interactions between the classes. It wasn't a single snippet, a Chrome snippet. It wasn't even a file. It was there in a scratch pad. We just ran and when we closed our browser, it was gone anyway. Now we took that thing to the backend we stepped into the backend domain. We installed Node.js on our computers so that we could run JavaScript in our computers, not on the browsers, like natively in our computers. And we created a project, an actual, a real project with npm in it, right? It's not like any file. We didn't just, we started like that. We just created a file, ran it, whatever. But at the end, the, the point that we are here now, we have a package JSON. It is a project. It's definitely a Node.js project, which you can just right this moment submit as an open source project. No one would probably use it as it is, but if you, hopefully with your homeworks, with the classes that you define, with the interactions that you define, hopefully you come up with something that the other world, other people in the world can use. That is the ultimate goal. That is the dream with the open source. You would not only use everyone's code, but also contribute back. You give back to the society. You do something that anyone would want to use. In this case, the terminal coloring apparently is used by 18 million people this week only, this week only. Imagine how many people would use it in overall, all right? So this is an amazing achievement. We, 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 put, we created a project, we created classes which are not in the same file. We 
we separated them into different modules. We created modules of our own. And on index.js, we required them. Even we required another dependency somewhere. And we just somehow stick them together, tie them together, and made it work. We have two persons attending a meetup. And the meetup reports itself with colorful text that it has its name, its location, and it just lists the attendees. This is, this is amazing. This is, this is how we start, you know? We will just put, we will just keep putting on top of this. But this is already an amazing achievement in terms of backend engineering. We have an actual project that's running on our computer. All right, where do we go next? The next thing we're going to work on is to save things into a file. Currently, we're already saving things in the index.js, like in terms of saving, as we're pressing control save or command save. But what I mean is, in terms of the software, in terms of programming, we need to put things somewhere so that we could access them later on. In this case, we created persons, meetups. But whenever we run our code, we would create a new person. We would create a new person. It's, just, it's not the same person. We just create a new instance of a person with it happens to have the Arma, Arman's name. Like it's just a new person, just mimics that person, but it's not actually that. But every time I run it, it's a new person. Imagine in real life, imagine that you're Facebook, let's say, and there are likes, there are posts, there are many things, there are many interactions that's happening with an entity. Let's say a user, in this case, person, a user that's using Facebook that has many likes with their post. And every time Facebook runs, let's say, it doesn't create those likes from scratch. It doesn't ask people, okay, you had liked before, please like it again. We don't do it, right? There's something called databases. Have you ever heard the name database? Please raise your hand if you heard the name database before. All right, that's amazing. That's cool. Databases are glorified file systems that allows you to save things into somebody else's computer. Right? On clouds, wherever it is. You just save things there and then read from the database. But before making the leap to the database, you would just start with something small. A file. A single file is also a database, if you think about it. It's just a thing that you put things in, you close it, and then you open it, it's there. It's 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 a database. Right? Every Excel file that you have created so far in your life were databases actually. Um, and basically they follow the same structure. They have tables, they have rows, they have columns. All these words actually are legit <laughs> names in the database world. They have mappings. So yeah, probably everybody created a lot of databases in their lives so far. And every note taking app that you use to put in your reminders or checklists, your to-do notes and everything, they were all databases. You were creating your own databases. And now we're gonna move forward with um, our own database for the person uh, meetup classes or this application. And in the coming weeks, we're going to switch to MongoDB. So this is a nice journey. We start with the memory, where we create everything in the memory. Then right now, we're going to learn how to write them into files, much like a uh, Excel file. Um, and then in, in the coming weeks, we're going to transform it into a MongoDB database instance, which is a real life database that other people can use as well. Right, amazing. So for us to have to write to the database, I need to abstract that logic, just like we did with persons. I could just type the reading file, saving to a file into the index.js, but we are better than that, right? We learned how to organize our code into modules. And for database, it's a separation of concepts. We just want another module that handles the database operation. I don't want the person to deal with saving the file, reading the file, whatever. It's just a person. It just exists, and it just does what it needs. It attends to meetings, and meetings just report things. It just doesn't save things. For, for us to be able to save things, we need another module. To have another module, what do we do? Please raise your hands and tell me. Yes, please. Um, we create another file. Another file. And then we also export the Amazing. That's 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 correct. And just like uh, she said, we're going to create a new file in the wrong place. I mean, uh, oh, you don't see it. So I have to <laughs> dictate it. Um, no, not dictation, right? Yes, I have to just announce what I see on my screen. I just clicked 
on the uh, on any of the files in the in the folder and I just click new file just like I did with the previous ones and this time I'm just going to name it database it's just apt right database.js it's another js file it's another module right and it needs to have a module that exports but what what should it do it should a database let's think in abstract the database should be able to say something right and it should be able to read something so that we probably need two methods at least two methods to save things one for saving things and the other one is for loading things to read the file into memory so i'm just going to uh, just create a function let's say const save it's just a good name right and it is a function what should save do it should take something as an argument right a collection of things or a single thing whatever it should take that thing and then save it into the file system so technically printing it onto the console with console log is kind of saving it into the terminal so i'll just start with that something that we already know logging it onto the console it's just an abstraction like we, of course it won't stay there terminal but it's just a way that we move that, that we will put on top of it so here i will have a console.log what should it log it should take a parameter here right somewhere it should have data let's call it data naming is so so hard i just start with data maybe we'll change it afterwards and then i'm just going to log it console log data and i need to somehow export it right but this is not a class and we'll have multiple things so i need another way of exporting things what did we do before module that exports equals the class but here i would like okay i could do save here but that would work if i require this file i could just access the save but then how would i add the load file it's it's hard what we learned before is that we could have multiple things in an object right we could we had name and location for meetup it was an object in the first lecture if you remember before using classes we were just creating regular objects with curly brackets putting things in it it was we could just access their properties so i'm just going to create an object that i could expose to the other world whenever that world requires my file they will get that object and that object will have two functions in it right one of them would be a save function could be let's start with that let me just not complicate things and just copy it here and i will just delete it so i have a single module that exports it has a single property that says save and it is a function it's a function and it just logs things so what i need to do here in the index.js if i want yes, to it was too fast but yeah. Yeah. sorry <laughs> I'm going back to the database.js. That is the new file that I created, right? It's a new module. I just moved it here into the object. It's here. So it now reads module that exports equals an object, a new object that I created from scratch. It has a property called save, and you use the column there after the property name to indicate its value. Um, previously, it was a string name or age. And here it's another function. And that function is basically logging the data. Function in parentheses data. And in curly brackets, you have console log data to log everything that's coming in to that save function to the console. And obviously, um, in a few minutes, we're not only going to save it to the console, but also to a separate file so that um, when you restart your computer, you can read that file back and get the data that you already saved. Okay. So the question is, do we always write the word function, or is there another way of doing it? Yeah, we don't actually need to write function. There is a. Um, it's basically the same thing. This is the arrow syntax, short syntax. Um, <coughs> what you can do is you can type um, again save colon and then 
in, after data, you can have the fat arrow. It's um, called fat arrow. And this is the same thing. This will work. And there is yet another way of doing it, unfortunately. It's a um, shorthand. This is a little bit shorter. You can also remove the column and just say type save. And in parentheses, you could um, just have the, the parameter and it also already becomes a function. So there are multiple ways of writing a function. Again, you can read more about these things. Um, but yeah, we can just move forward with, with this version right now. Okay. So in order to use that save function, I need to require it in our, in our index.js, right? To be able to use it. I'm just doing the same thing that I did before. I'm just going to require it. Uh, I'm typing const database equals require parentheses in a string dot slash database. So I typed const database equals require dot slash database. That would allow me to access its own contents, right? It would allow me to access the save function. So at the end of my file, I just want to, if I want to save the meetup object, that's the WTM, I want to save it somewhere. In this case, the terminal, I would, I just would, I just call database dot save. If you can see, whenever you press the dot, your ID is intelligent enough to list the properties that is already available to you. The first thing that it shows me is the save method. That means that I can already access that save method, right? So as a parameter, I would just give WTMB into the save function and then save the file and then run it with node index.js. Uh, you can see that we have successfully logged, saved our meetup into the console. So that's all. Can you go back to the of, of course, sure. Let me go back to the index.js. I just, if you remember, I require the database at the top of the file. All right. Yeah. And at, in the last, at the end of the file, I just use database.save which we all exported through module.export already, that would take a single parameter, which we provide here with the meetup object that is already instantiated. I just give it as an argument, as a parameter, sorry, and then it just saves it to console log. But I want to improve on that. I don't want to save it to console. I just want to save it to an actual real file. And to be able to do that, I need to use a special library that is called the file system in the Node.js world. It's a native library. It's just like another library, another module that we, that we install from NPM. But this time, we don't need to install it. It's already there. It's available in the Node.js environment. But we need all, all we need to do is to require it. What I need to do is I'm, I'm in, the, in the database.js file now. I'm, I will require a new library that is called fs. It's short for file system, all right? Const fs equals, again, the same keyword, require, and the same way that I would require anything. fs, it's a special library because that's why it doesn't need the path prefix. It's just like node modules, but you don't have to install it. It's already there. It's in every Node.js installation. You have access to the fs library, all right? And now I need to... This, for this, you need to know how FS works. There are some things that it just, you need to read about. You need to learn about it. Not, nothing comes for free. Sometimes you need to learn things. Just like I knew console log existed, I didn't type all the words that like I would hope to come up with something. No, I knew that console log exi existed. So in this case, I knew that FS, this library, what, like, does what I wanted to do. It just writes and reads files. So fs dot, if I press dot with the fs that I just required, I see a lot of, a lot of methods that I could see. Here, for those that cannot see, there are a lot of link, mkdir, open, open seek, read file. Oh, okay, that's interesting, read file. We will probably use that, but this time we need write file, save file, something like that. Let's search for it. Let's search for it. Okay, I see that there's a write file method. That's something that we want to use. We want to write to a file in this case, all right? And just below that, I see that there's a write file sync. There's a difference between them. I won't get into the details. That's for the next lecture. In the next lecture, you're going to see, you're going to learn about asynchronous programming. The sync is short for synchronous operation. 
which means that it will run whenever you call it. So I'm not going to get into details. Next lecture is for that. I just selected write file sync, all right, to be able to write to a file. And it just takes two arguments. It should supposed to show me what those arguments are, but I already know. The first one is the file name. You could just, again, read the documents and understand how it works. Its, it's first name is the file name. So let me just give it a file name that I want to save to which in the JavaScript world, we use JSON as the file type. Generally, it's JavaScript object notation that is a representation of JavaScript objects. It is the easiest way to represent objects in JavaScript in the real world. So I'm just going to call it data.json, OK? Data.json. And I'm going to run the file. You could see that on the left hand side, you see a data.json has just appeared. Whenever I click on it, it says undefined. Why do you think so? Why is, why is that one undefined? Do you have, does anyone have any idea? Please raise your hands and tell me. Because you have two arguments, you have to pass also the, the information. So I need to pass the data in this in, as a parameter. I just received the data from the outside world, but I don't save it anywhere. I just gave it the file name. It just wrote something that it does just doesn't know. The second argument, okay, now it appeared. Second argument is the thing that I want to write into that file. So I just pass data as the second parameter to write file sync method, all right? This time, I just passed on the data. And if I run it, I could see that in the data.json, I see that weird thing that says object, object. As if one wasn't enough, it says object, object. Do you have any idea why this is so? Please raise your hand and tell me why do I see an object object in my data.json? Please. Is it something like a reference to an object? Is it something like a reference, he said. Does anyone have any other idea about it? Yes, please. I can't hear you. Everything is an object? Everything is an object. In JavaScript. But why don't we see the details of, of the object? This is, yeah, please. Is it because the object is then in JSON format? Yes, um, something like that, exactly. The thing is, write file sync does not know what to say. It just understands string. If you give it a string, it can save it to a file. If you give it anything else, it just doesn't know how to um, interpret that, how to understand that. In this case, we're giving it an object, but we don't tell it how to convert it into a string. And therefore, it just says, you know, this is an object. I don't know what to do with this. Give me a string. I can save a string. I can save names and, and stuff, but I cannot save an object. Um, and therefore, we need to help this, um, this database module and say, hey, the incoming data is an object. OK? Understand it. Take it as an object convert it to string, and then save it. If you directly save it, um, you don't know what, what details it has. So first, you have to convert it into string, the incoming object. First, you have to convert it into string, and then you can write it to um, a file. Now, there is um, a very straightforward method to do so. This is, again, something you just know if you Google for it in on Stack Overflow or something. Um, it's json. Stringify. Um, JSON in capital letters. Dot stringify is a method that takes in anything and can can convert it into an understandable string. And we wrap the data, the incoming data, with this. Oh, finally we're back with the computer. We wrap the incoming data with this function <coughs> JSON. Dot stringify. And what this does is this converts the object into readable string, because json.stringify knows how to convert objects into strings, into text. And when you finally um, run it, you see that in data.json, 
there is, in fact, an object, the meetup object. Right? A string representation of the meetup object. With all the properties, all the names of the attendees, and everything that you created, it's now stored as a file. And this is basically a database for you. Now, if you can, and I hope um, we'll yes. have time. 15 minutes. Um, in fact, we're over time, but hopefully they won't kick us out for the last 15 minutes. We can go over to the last part. In, if you know how to read this back, you can create these objects back. And you know you can email this data JSON to a friend, and that friend can also create those objects back because this file holds all the details of um, of the objects that you already created, right? Um, so you already created your database. The the actual syntax doesn't matter. What we write to make it doesn't really matter. The idea is this is pretty much everything that's behind all the cloud applications, all Facebook, Instagram, whatever, they all have databases, it's pretty much doing the same thing. There's a save method that saves something somewhere, like a file, and then there's a load method that reads that file and creates those objects back because it has the definitions of those objects. So there are web applications, real life applications, that only use files as databases. In fact, to create a real-life application, you don't need anything more than this. You can just you know, go on and create an application right now. Um, but obviously, we're going to go into further detail. Now, the, the law syntax is basically, oh yeah, thank you for, yeah, yeah, this is fine. Thank you, thank you for, for the project there again. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to do the reverse operation. We write to the file, what, what do we need to do in order to create those um, objects again? We now have a file data.json. The question is, what do we need to do right now to load them back into memory? We wrote them to a file. What do we need to do right now? Read. 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 Yes, it's as simple as that. So we just say fs.readfilesync. Um, just the opposite of this operation. And basically what it does is data.json. What this does is it takes in the data JSON and reads it. Now we wrote text into this file, right? So when you read it for the first time, what are you gonna get back? Do you get objects back or text back? you get text back, right? Because you just wrote text into that file. Obviously, there has to be a reverse operation, right? That converts this text back into real objects that the, um, the program can use, right? So we had real life objects, Arman, Mart, Mita. And what we did is we converted them into text and we saved them to a file. On the load step, we load them from the database, but it's currently text. And we need another way of converting these back to actual objects. And it's, again, an operation on the JSON um, class. So it's JSON that... I'll just um, type it, but before doing that, you can see that the files are binary in computer sense, and whenever we read them, you just see gibberish, ones and zeros. If you are just... If you know all of these representations, how does the ASCII, how does the characters map to binary, you could understand, but it's not for humans to read. So as Arman mentioned, we need a reverse operation that we need to do, and it's json.parse. So what parse does is it takes in a file, uh, sorry, it takes in a string and creates objects from it. Because json.stringify knows how to convert objects into text, json.parse, does the reverse, knows how to convert text into objects, okay? And normally, this um, does it work? Does it, it works. Yeah, so you just say json.parse in parentheses fs read file sync. Is there any arguments? Already? No, I didn't yeah. give it, it's just probably yeah. they changed the defaults. Yeah, and when you go back to index.js, you see that when you 
um, log the outcome. It's objects now. It's not text anymore. It's like real objects with name, location, attendees. So we converted the text file back into objects that we can work with. Just to prove this, um, you can log console log loaded file dot attendees and when you run this console log loaded file dot attendees when you run this you're only gonna get back the attendees array the list of the attendees it's right? an actual object so this is not text anymore question uh, yeah I'm just ah, okay so uh, so the idea is we introduced the concept of a database, which currently saves everything to a file. Everything that's coming in it to a file. And we also built functions to read from that. Uh, if you go to database.js. So our database is very primitive. It can save stuff and load stuff. But that's already the basis of, of every single web application. Um, so now this is pretty much the idea of the second homework, right? We expect you to create separate um, modules for your classes like meetup and person.js and also create a database.js, okay? That will save them to files and read them from files. Obviously, we're going to provide all the code that we wrote so far. It will be on GitHub, and I can uh, post the link again on Slack as well. So you're going to get everything that we typed here. You can directly make use of this database uh, file that we're going to provide you. But we expect to see a JSON file, like J data JSON, <coughs> that can hold your data, okay? That can hold your instances, your objects that you created for whatever project you have. Uh, the example was Twitter. Like, Right, that data.json should hold tweets or users or users with tweets and likes, whatever your project is, right? Um, and this is basically pretty much it. In fact, um, next week we're going to talk about asynchronous programming. So we're going to remove that sync from there. And the week after, we're going to talk about web applications and the week after we're going to talk about databases and you're going to see that we're just incrementally build on this thing this database class will be a um, a representation of an actual real database it will not work with files but with a real mongodb database which hopefully some of you already installed on our machines um, and we're going to take it on from there you know in fact, again, this can function as a real application right now. The only thing that's keeping us um, to our local machines is that we don't have any way of publishing these objects somewhere. And that's what we're going to build in two weeks, a web server. So that people from the internet can create objects in your database and can see the objects in your database. And we're going to use basically the same thing. We're going to use the same file, the same JSON file. And each of you will be able to write to each other databases. So um, this is a very smooth path to application building. And again, the idea is this is very, very easy, very, very straightforward. Of course, to get the individual syntax right, you have to work hard. You'll make a lot of mistakes. You'll have a lot of frustration while doing the homework. These are all expected. What we expect you is to persist because you can hopefully already see some light at the end of the tunnel where this becomes a real life web application. Um, and you can still build an application just by using files as databases. In fact, if you have you know, a thousand users, you can pretty much live with files you don't need a database. Um, so most applications that you build your, for yourself don't actually require a database. Um, so I'm just telling these to, um, to motivate you in the sense that people position software development, software engineering as a very hard topic, as you know, something that's unreachable, that's out there, only the genius people can understand. No, it's as simple as this. 
you know, once you get the idea of a database of saving some stuff, of loading some stuff, there is nothing else. The only missing piece that we're going to build again is the web server, where we export our application to the internet, to every uh, other person on the internet, and then we're done, basically. Question? Can you go back to the index? Doctor? Index. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, but some more top. How you're using the log methods? Yeah. So database load already gives you the uh, the objects back, and what we do is we just log it. Console dot log um, loaded file dot attendees, for example. You could do loaded file dot name, loaded file dot location, because it's already a real life object that you can work with. Okay. In fact, um, if you remove all the lines about this, Mart equals new person, um, consarman equals new person, whatever. If you remove all of these things, the database holds the source of truth. You can read the database back, and it already gives you all of these objects back, right? I'll just delete it. That is the just idea of case. database. I need so the, just, the yeah. database, obviously. Clean up everything. Now this is a four line code even three yeah three there is nothing else in the whole index.js file right we deleted everything here all the references to other modules oh. and everything and even this i could just do it like this yeah like two lines and when Require i require database and load the database and when you run it you're going to see all the objects again and again you can type that attendees um, square break zero that name and it's gonna give our money right so this is the idea of a database it's a central storage you see when you run the application you get the name back our money this is basically um, how all the backend applications work there is a database out there and you don't do anything you just load the database and get some records from the database and display the results. It's all what web applications are doing. Um, question? Yes. Yeah. Right now, um, I'm I can override my data in my new file. Yes. So first, I can save the data, and then I want to save also the person. But then I only have my person. I yes. Great. So the question is, the question is, if you want to save multiple types of data, what what do you do? Because currently it's overriding. First you save the meetup. Then if you want to save the person as a separate file. Yeah. Or if you change something in the meetup, then you. If you change something in the meetup, it gets overridden. Yes. Um, obviously there are further concepts like saving multiple records, you're referencing them with IDs and stuff, and we're going to see that with actual databases. But here's a very short um, solution. You can have multiple databases. You can have one database per class. You can have person database, and you can have meetup database. Person, person JSON, database, yeah. And meetup the JSON, you can save them. Person JSON, meetup JSON, person <laughs> database saves people into person JS, uh, JSON. Meetup database would say meetups into meetup case so that they only overwrite um, individual single records. As you can um, see, I hard coded this data.json here. It just saves always there. But you can, in your own projects, you can just provide another parameter to the save function to give the name of the file that you would like to save. And then you could use, use that variable to actually save it. It doesn't have to be data.json. This is just hard-coded string that I provided here. But you can give it, turn it into a parameter so that we can make use of it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to wrap up today's lecture. Sorry for the inconveniences with, with the setup that we have. Uh, hopefully, next week, we're going to solve all of these things. Um, are there any questions about the homework? Is it clear what we're expected to do? Let me rephrase it again. We expect you to create individual files as modules for your classes in your projects. The idea is you have at least three classes in your project and two different interactions between them, like attend. Meetup is a class, person is a class, and attend is an interaction. And we need three interactions um, in your homeworks between these classes. Okay? We expect to see separate files, separate modules, that are integrated in index.json, index.js. 
Um, and we expect you to make use of this database that we introduced. So that you can save the files to your hard drive, okay? Or put them on GitHub or whatever. Or you can send it um, over via email and someone else can read those objects back. Um, obviously, I'm gonna post the homework with hopefully better um, phrasing on Slack. So make sure you check um, Slack frequently. Also, everybody shares their homeworks there. So make sure you check it every day and see what other people are doing, building for their homeworks, so that you get inspired by them. Because in the end, you are not competing with each other, right? The goal is everybody become a software engineer. So um, we can only achieve that by sharing. Whatever you know, help each other and um, make this a, a better place for everybody. Um, before we wrap up, are there any final questions about about today's class? There's one. Uh, do we start to count uh, with zero, just like in Java? Yes. Yes. The index starts. We start counting from zero. So this attendee zero is the first item. Yes. Okay. Um, we will share a feedback form again. Please fill it so that we can also improve ourselves. Hope you enjoyed today's uh, class. And again, give Merit a big round of applause for technical.